Raise your hand if you recognize this painting. Oh, wow, quite a few of you. Bonus points if you can name the painter. Yes, yes, that's right. Now he's Norwegian, so I assume it's Edvard Munch, something like that. But what, what is it? Monk? Okay, great, thank you, thanks for the correction. So Edvard Munch, a Norwegian painter, painting during, painting during the Impressionist era, he understood how I felt the first time I had to deliver a truly high stakes presentation. Your predecessor was fired for three reasons. That's what my boss told me when I took a job managing an inside sales team for a manufacturing company based in the Los Angeles area. He said, number one, the field sales organization and the customers are constantly complaining about the lack of product knowledge from the inside sales team. Number two, the field sales team, the customers, they're constantly complaining about the slow response time from the inside sales team. And number three, the turnover on the team is way too high. Just to the point where people get to know how to do their job, they leave, they go somewhere else. So I had very clear success criteria. And I remember about a year later, I'm sitting at my desk, I'm working away, the phone rings, I pick it up. On the other end of the line is an offer to speak at the company's annual sales kickoff. Now, raise your hand if you've ever been to an, a sales kickoff. Oh. Okay, just a few hands go up. Raise your hand if you've ever been to a conference. Why aren't you all raising your hands? You're at one right now. Okay, so it's, you know, it's maybe not that different from Xamarin. It's, the focus isn't up about mobile development. It's about new releases and new products and trying to get the sales team charged up. And I think that much like uh, many conferences like this, the sales kickoff, if you've never been to one, it can be distilled into three verbs. Number one, somebody's always speaking. Number two, as a participant, you are almost always eating. And then after hours, that's when the drinking begins. Exactly. So I remember I get this offer on the phone, and when I heard you have an opportunity to speak at the, the company's annual sales kickoff, my initial response was, yes, because I felt that my team had made progress in all three areas. In other words, I felt like we understood the product pretty well, we were definitely far more responsive, and the team had stabilized. So when I heard this offer, I thought, yes, great. Love to do a 10 minute talk at the annual sales kickoff. Hung up the phone, spent the rest of the day feeling really good about that decision. Until about 2.30 a.m. the next morning. When I woke up and it hit me what I had volunteered myself for. The audience would be filled with the entire sales force. In addition, my boss, the vice president of sales, his boss, the president of the company, his boss, the CEO, even the co-founder, the chairman of the board was gonna be in that audience. And I started to try to wrap my head around this. I had never delivered a presentation for more than five people in my entire professional career. And then I started thinking about, okay, so sales kickoff, uh, all right, what is that like? What, a, what am I gonna be walking into? And the only reference that I had was one year prior, I just joined the company, I'd been there about a month, 
I remember walking in the door thinking, okay, I'm new to the organization. I'm going to be warmly welcomed into the bosom of the family. No. Before I had my, bat, my name tag on, sales reps were coming up to me and saying things like, can you explain to me why it takes your team so long to put together a quote? I really don't get why it's that complicated. Or another guy says, hey, can I get some samples that I asked for two weeks ago? My favorite was the guy who came up to me and said, are your people going to, I don't know, return my phone calls now? That was the audience that I was going to be speaking to. So I started to feel a little bit anxious. And I remember being on the plane. I'm flying from L.A. to Washington National because the kickoff was going to be in Virginia that year. And I remember I'm on the plane and, and I'm preparing my remarks. I'm putting together, well, okay, what am I going to say? And what visuals will I use, et cetera? And I keep seeing this image in my mind. I'm standing in front of this group of people and I'm spewing claims about all the improvements that my team has made. And what I see out in the audience are all these sales reps and they all kind of look like this. Their whole demeanor just screams scorn and skepticism. The, evolve, the proper Evolve conference is about two and a half days long. That was exactly how long our conference was. So many of you showed up last night, probably be staying through midday Friday. That was ex pretty much exactly how ours was going as well. So I remember I get there the first night, there's a cocktail party just like there was last night. And one of the things that I have learned about salespeople over the years is that there is a small group of them that are truly exceptional at selling. But apparently most of them are pretty good at drinking. So I remember the first night, it was about, I don't know, 1 o'clock in the morning, 1.30, and I'm beat. I'm ready to go to bed. I, I, I'm not a big drinker. It's just not my thing. So I went to bed, and I fully expected I'm going to show up at the breakfast tomorrow at 7.30. I'll be one of the first people there. Some of those guys are going to walk in. They're not going to look like they had, a, they had a good night. But I show up, and there's a bunch of those sales guys from last night. They have a beverage in their hand. Of course, now it's coffee instead of alcohol. Had they not changed their clothes, I might not have known that they left. They have the same level of energy and enthusiasm. They're just as chatty as they were the night before. Well, that was the case the first morning. But by the third morning, many of them looked like they were going to be auditioning for The Walking Dead. They walked in looking like that. Guess when I was scheduled to speak? Third morning. I, was, I think I was the next to the last speaker. So there was just one other speaker that separated them from their flight home. Now, just like you are, I was sitting out in the audience and I'm observing this whole dynamic unfold over the last two and a half days or two days. And by the time they, they call my name, you know, I'm just like everybody else, I'm sitting out here. And they call my name, they introduce me. And I, I get up out of my seat and I start to walk to the front of the room. And my notes in my hand are visibly shaking, which was pretty distracting. Now, I'll tell you today, as a speaker coach, that's my, one of the things that I do. I coached a lot of the speakers here at, at the Evolve Conference. I'm not a big fan of podiums. You've probably all been to these talks and conferences where people will position themselves behind the podium and they never move from that spot. I'm not a believer in that. I think it just creates a barrier between you and your audience. But on that particular day, I was a huge fan of podiums. Because now I could grab a hold of that thing. My hands aren't shaking anymore. Oh, bless you, podium. So I started in my talk. And for, 
90 seconds or so, I thought it was going reasonably well. Until I noticed that I could feel my pulse at my temples. And that distracted me for the next little while until this eyelid began to spasm violently. And I was certain that everyone in the room was looking at that eyelid. I don't remember a lot of what happened after that, frankly. But I do remember that eventually my 10 minutes was mercifully over. And I picked up my notes, and as I headed back to my seat, it felt like for the first time in that entire 10 minute span, I actually saw a face of a human being out in the audience. Everything else before that had pretty much been a blur. Now as I look back on that experience today, I now understand that I had actually been using a technique. I didn't know I was using a technique. Certainly didn't know I was, I certainly wasn't using it the way it was intended to be used. But I was using a technique which is called creative visualization. Raise your hand if you are familiar with this or have heard this term before. Okay, very good. So is it Sean, am I getting that right, right here? How have you heard that used? Yeah, this would be a good time. Would you mind telling me how to? Um, you pictured the audience in an embarrassing. Uh... Say that again? It, it pictured the audience in something embarrassing. So you picture them in, uh, in something embarrassing? Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Well, that's one form of creative visualization. I've heard it said, thank you very much. You can give, give that back to, and, and it's Meyer. Is that, am I getting that right? Meyer? Thank you, Meyer. I've heard it said that one of the ways you can use this technique is you imagine the audience naked. I'm not a believer in that because I figure that most of the people in the audience I would not want to see naked, which is distracting. And then there would be a few select people that I would want to see naked, and that would be even more distracting. So I actually don't recommend that technique. But what you're describing, the fundamental idea is that you imagine something that helps you feel more comfortable, more confident, right? All right, anybody else heard that? Who else? Aaron, you had your hand up, right? How have you heard that used? Well, likewise, <laughs> naked people in the audience. OK. But um, I think the key is just to sort of imagine something that makes you feel more comfortable is there with you so that you can kind of come back to that and collect your thoughts and continue, I guess. Yeah, now the, thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Now, the, the fundamental idea of creative visualization is that it's intended to help you perform better because it's not exclusive to just this particular application. In other words, it's not just about helping you be a better speaker. It can help you perform any task better. And the idea is that you want to visualize the outcome that you want. So the I, this fundamental practice of visualization is very, very powerful. I have worked with clients for 17 years now doing this work, and I have seen it take people from, I loathe public speaking, I hate it, I don't like doing it, to I love public speaking, I can't wait for my next opportunity. It can help you make that transition from feeling that anx tremendous anxiety that can be debilitating to feeling really confident and excited about the opportunity to get up in front of a group of people. Now, how many of you came here today because you're interested in that kind of an experience where you want to get from, I feel anxious, I feel nervous, I have trouble concentrating to, I want to be excited, I want to want to get up and speak? How many of you are in that place? All right, then how many of you would say that today, when you're asked to come to speak to a room full of people, for example, if I 
if I just volunteered you and got you up here and you didn't even know what you were going to do, how many of you would feel some anxiety about that or even feeling it right now? Like, oh my God, is he really going to do that? Okay, so a lot of hands going up. All right, then you came to the right room. Because what I want to do now is share with you this powerful technique. In fact, what I want you to understand is that it is perfectly normal to feel anxiety about public speaking because stuff can go wrong. And there's a lot of people who see it go wrong. And it can have a negative impact on your career. So it's normal. It, in fact, it's, it's, you could say that we're programmed, we're, we're DNA encoded to feel anxiety about any high risk situation. And this is a high risk situation. Things can go wrong. However, if you imagine, if you vividly see success, then it's far more likely that that's the outcome you get, is success. However, like any technique, it doesn't help you if you don't practice it. So I'm going to ask you to do something right now, which is I'm going to ask you to practice it. And I will guide you step by step through a creative visualization. And what I want you to do is I just want, to no I want you to notice the experience of it. Notice how you feel when we start. Notice how you feel when we finish. And for this, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. The reason I want you to close your eyes is I don't want you to be distracted by the visual stimulus, what's happening in this room, with the possible exception of a couple of folks here. So now, here's what I want you to imagine. I want you to imagine that you are going, you're getting ready to speak in the most intimidating, daunting situation you can imagine. So maybe that's a, a big room, a, a keynote, like we just saw with Nat and Miguel and the rest of the Xamarin team. Maybe you're being asked to go do that. Or perhaps you are being asked to speak to the boardroom. These are the most senior executives in your organization. Or perhaps you are being asked to speak to your peers. Many of my clients tell me they feel that their peers are the toughest audience they face. So what I'm saying is I want you to pick the setting that you're going to present into. Now I want you to see that setting as vividly as you can. See the room. So maybe it looks like a room like this, a big hotel room. Or maybe it's a really big room like the room we saw the, the keynote in. Or maybe it's a small room with a half dozen people or even a dozen people in it, but very important people that have a direct impact on your future. So I want you to see that room as vividly as you can. Is it big? Is it small? Is it light? Is it dark? Is it noisy? Is it quiet? What kind of furniture is in the room? And who else is in the room with you? See those people in your mind as vividly as you can. Now add to all of that the sight and the sound of someone introducing you, which means you're on. I want you to notice if when I say that, a, a physiological response occurs. You feel a sensation that you associate with anxiety. Just notice that feeling. Notice where it, it, it's centered in your body. And I'm going to come back to that in a little bit. I'll tell you why I want you to notice it. So just notice the feeling. Now imagine that as you are getting up from your seat or you're walking up to the stage or walking to the front of the room, that you are transforming that feeling, that feeling of fear or anxiety or whatever you want to call it, to a feeling of excitement. Somebody once said, fear is excitement without the breathing. So in addition to the visualization, now what I want you to do is I want you to start to focus on your breathing. It will help if you sit upright. So if you sit, for example, on the edge of your chair, 
and you've got your spine as straight up and erect as it can be, that'll be, that will help. With your mouth closed, if you can do this, I want you to inhale through your nostrils, take four seconds to fill your entire lung capacity. So it'd be something like this. And then you're gonna take four seconds to completely, completely empty out your lungs. Keep breathing in that measured pace, four seconds in, four seconds out. And as you're doing that, put yourself back in that room as you're walking to the front, you're getting ready to do your presentation. Now maybe you've got to do a little setup. Like, for example, when I came in this, this morning at 10.30 to get ready, I had to connect my laptop to the projector. I had some things that I'm going to use during the course of it. I had to get those in place. I had to get my water. You're doing those little final pieces of housekeeping. But as you're doing all that, you're breathing. You've completed all that. You're done with your setup. This is it. This is the moment when you begin, which many people say is the hardest part. You step into the middle of the space where you can see everyone. Everyone can see you. You look out into the audience. You pick one face and you connect with that person with eye contact. You speak just or you look just at them. You take in one more deep inhalation. And using that air, you launch into the opening that you have carefully crafted and practiced. And in a minute, I'm going to share with you techniques that will make your openings killer openings. And so you deliver this killer opening. And the audience responds. They respond well. Maybe they are taking notes. Maybe they are nodding, maybe they are smiling, maybe they're even laughing, but they are certainly listening. They're engaged. And you feel a surge of confidence. That feeling of, oh, this is going well. I like this. And that feeling continues because you've crafted your material. You've practiced your material. In a sense, it's almost like muscle memory now. And all the things that you thought were going to work are working. And the things that aren't working, you just roll with it. Because I promise you that if you have this idea that there's someday going to be a perfect presentation that you're going to deliver, it won't happen. Think, things will go wrong. And it's that ability to just roll with it is part of it. So you imagine yourself as part of your visualization. You imagine little things happening that aren't perfect, but you just roll with it. And then you deliver your conclusion. And then there's this moment of stillness. The audience is digesting your final point. And then they begin to applaud with genuine, enthusiastic applause. You stand there for a moment, graciously accept, accepting, acknowledging the gift of that appreciation. And then when the timing is right, you head back to your seat. You sit down, your talk is done. And on the journey back to your seat, the people that, that are in your audience, maybe your friends and colleagues, are congratulating you. They're saying, hey, great job, good, jo good presentation, way to go, you nailed it. You're sitting back in your seat, you're, you're done. And now what I want you to do is the final piece of this visualization, is I want you to see if you can feel that feeling that you get when you have faced a particularly daunting difficult challenge, but because you did the work, you prepared, you rose to the occasion and you even surpassed your own expectations. And it's that feeling of satisfaction of having climbed a mountain successfully, that's the feeling I want you to have. 
And when you have that feeling, would you please open your eyes? Now, how many of you, when I said, you're on, this is it, felt a familiar sensation of anxiety? Raise your hand if that happened for you. All right, leave your hand up for a moment and look around. That is proof that visualization works. I was describing something that isn't happening, it isn't real, but your brain doesn't know the difference. The brain believes that it's real, that it's happening. I was in the Darwin Lounge last night. Anybody get to try the Oculus Rift? We were talking about this, right, Rob? Your brain doesn't know that you're not on a roller coaster. I got, I got done it. I was queasy. I'm telling you. That's the, the, the fundamental brain technology that underlies visualization. All right. Now, those of you, remember, you, you had your hands up if you felt that feeling, right? Raise your hand if you, if you felt it. Okay, great. Did it change for you at some point? Raise your hand if you noticed that it started to either dissipate or it went away entirely. Okay, very good. So, Mayur, here's where I need your help. Uh, there's a gentleman here with the gray pullover who's uh, follically challenged like I am. Yes. Tell me what happened there for you, sir. What's your name? Ryan. Ryan? Yes. What happened there for you? Would you mind standing up? Sure. Uh, when I started breathing, it just dissipated. It dissipated when you started breathing? Yeah. And would you, did it entirely disappear, or were there some remnants left behind? Very little that it didn't matter. Very little. Okay, great. Who else? Uh, oh, and, and Ryan, one other thing I forgot to ask, which is, where was it centered? Can you describe the sensation for us? It was in the chest. Chest? Yeah. Was it a tightness of the chest, or was it accelerated heart? Heavy, heaviness. Heaviness. Yeah. All right, and what did it feel like when it dissipated? Did you notice that? Lighter. Just lighter. Yeah. Okay, great. Who else had a, a vivid experience of that? Great. Uh, tell me your name again. Andy. 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 Would you share with us? Would you mind standing up and telling us what yeah, that was like? Not a problem. Um, it it wants to take away my voice. It just wants to. So steal is it kind of right voice. in here? Yeah, in the, in the center. In this area, and and how, how would you describe the sensation itself? Um, not being able to breathe. So having trouble getting a deep yeah. breath. Yeah. All right, and then you said that it eventually dissipated or, or went away, right? I had, a, I had a reflex to start breathing right around the time you said. To start oh, you did? Okay, yeah. good. Yeah, because I'd been through it before. So. All right, and then did it, did it actually dissipate or go away? Yes, yes, it was slow. It was slow, okay, great. All right, thank you. Yes. Thank you very much, Andy and, and uh, Meyer. Now... How many of you saw yourself in a big room, like the keynote type of situation? All right, how many, how many of you saw yourself in a small room, very intimate room? Okay, how many of you saw yourself with peers? Quite a few, all right. And how many of you, raise your hand, if at the end of the exercise you felt that feeling of satisfaction, of rich, deep satisfaction for having met a difficult challenge. Raise your hand if you felt that at the end. Okay, wonderful. If you didn't feel it, don't despair. It doesn't mean that it's not working. It just means that you need to keep practicing it so that you, you eventually are starting to feel that feeling of satisfaction. And the more you do that, the more you replace that feeling of anxiety with that feeling of excitement, of being calm and centered and focused. All right. Now, before I got to the point that I wanted to make about creative visualization, which you could say was my topic for this piece, that I've just delivered. Before I got anywhere close to that, I delivered what I call a hook, an opening hook, which is how I started this session. 
Raise your hand if you have a memory of what happened at the beginning of this session. You remembered something that I did. All right. Uh, Mayer, would you please hand the mic to Alfredo right here in the second row. Alfredo, what do you remember? What happened there at the beginning? In the first beginning, you start to uh, say hello to everybody. A little bit louder. Uh, you start to say hello to everybody. Okay, so there, that was as people were coming in, right? Right. But when the, the media appeared on the screen. Yeah, the, the picture of the, of the creepy. The, the picture of? Of the guy in the skirt. The guy screaming, right? Screaming. Yeah. Okay. So in a little while, I'm going to describe for you commonly used effective hook techniques, which are techniques that grab audience attention. Thank you, Alfredo. That was one. But I, what I want you to get from this talk and what I've been preaching for the last week and a half, two weeks, because I worked with Xamarin speakers in San Francisco, I worked in Boston, and then I've been working here in Atlanta. What I keep preaching is, number one, you need to use hook techniques often. So in other words, you need to be using them throughout your talk to keep your audience engaged. Number two, with your opening, you should have three hook techniques in quick succession. So we're going to cover that in a little bit. In other words, we're going to go into structure, how to structure a presentation so you get optimal results. How do you grab them in the beginning? How do you keep them involved? How do you clarify your message so you know your audience gets it? And number three, how do you lead them with a strong conclusion? But before we get there, I need some help. I want you to help me deconstruct the story that I just told you. Because the most powerful hook technique there is available, as far as I'm concerned, is a personal story. How many of you have an interest in learning how to become better storytellers? Raise your, okay, great. I was talking to Nish, where are you? Are you still here? No, he took off. I was talking to a gentleman last night from Bangalore who works for IBM. And he said that in India, that IBM puts their employees through a storytelling course. So they become better storytellers. So if you want to become a better storyteller, what you need to do is craft a story that includes the elements that I'm going to describe for you. Now here's my theory, is that if I did my job right, you will remember these elements as I describe them. In other words, for example, Good storytelling should have vivid characters. And if my theory is right, you will be able to describe for me the vivid characters that were in my story. So, Mayura, I need your help again. Raise your hand if you remember one of the characters that I described in my story. All right, and tell me your name again, sir. Sandy. Sandy. Would you give the mic to Sandy? Yeah, the, uh, the sales guys who are giving you a hard time. You okay. Know. Are you going to return my calls like that? Okay, good, good, thank you. So the sales guys, and how, what adjective would you use to describe the sales guys? Aggressive. Aggressive, all right. Did I ever use the word aggressive? No. No. All right, hold on to that because that's an important point about that. All right, who else had a, a character they remembered? All right, I don't want to just pick the Xamarin folks. So this gentleman back here in the corner, if you don't mind. What was your name, sir? Riaz. Riaz. Great, would you mind standing up? And tell us about the character that you remember. Uh, I believe the gentleman who was uh, hiring you and uh, explaining your predecessor's shortcomings. Um, OK, great. Thank you. The character, sir. Thank you very much. So you've got to create vivid characters in your stories. And you mentioned it, Andy. Am I getting that right? Sandy. I'm sorry, Sandy. And you mentioned it too, actually as you were describing the characters, you described the dialogue that took place between me and them. Your, your story should have exchanges of dialogue. Imagine for a moment that if your favorite novel was just narrative. In other words, there was never any exchange of dialogue between two characters. My guess is that it would be pretty boring. It would not be your favorite book. So you want to have an exchange of dialogue between characters. So who here could quote 
some of the, and I know Sandy, you, you did, but who else here could quote dialogue that I used in my story? All right, uh, this gentleman right here, I, I've already picked on you, Sean, so this gentleman right here with the sweater, if you don't mind, please. What was the dialogue you heard? Well, would you return my calls? Uh, you know, return, uh, yeah, those three. So it was dialogue. about returning phone yeah. calls, right? Yeah. Okay, good. So this, to me, is, is the point, is that if you do a good job, that it's sticky enough that your audience can approximate what was actually said in that exchange of dialogue. All right, the next thing is this idea of conflict. Now, my training was originally in the theater. I was trained first as an actor, then trained to teach actors, then trained as a director, and I've also worked as a writer and producer. Etc. But one of the things that I learned very early on, I was taught this very early as an actor, was heighten the conflict. Good storytelling is all about heightening conflict, heightening tension. So where, raise your hand if you could describe some conflict that occurred in the story. Raise your hand if you could do that. All right, this gentleman back here, you and I were sitting next to each other at the keynote this morning. Great, what was your name again, sir? Jim. Jim, right, of course, Jim. So Jim, what conflict, where was there conflict in the story? You mentioned the person who came up and said, uh, when are you gonna start returning my calls? When are, you gonna, when are your people gonna start returning my phone calls? Exactly, so there was conflict there, right? Okay, thank you. Was, anybody name another example of conflict in the story? Yes, back here in the back. Uh, when you decided to give the talk and then we're like, oh crap, I shouldn't have done that. Exactly. So what was my first reaction? Do you remember that? Uh, you were very ex uh, excited and, and happy to be doing I was that. initially excited and then I was like, oh, why did I get myself into this? Right. So thank you. That's what we call inner conflict, meaning the conflict within the protagonist themselves. And, and I would bet you that if you go home and you look at your video library or you look at your library of fiction the protagonist, the, the hero of the story, if you will, will have some significant inner conflict that they're wrestling with over the course of the story. So not only should you include, if, if you can, conflict between different people, different forces, different factions, et cetera, but also what's the conflict within the protagonist of the story, even if that protagonist is you. All right, thank you. High stakes. If there's nothing at stake, in the story, no one will care. What is at stake, raise your hand if you could describe what is at stake in The Lord of the Rings. In other words, if Frodo doesn't drop that, that ring into the, the fires in Mordor, what is at stake? Sean, I guess you're it, my friend. Would you, what is at stake in that particular situation? Uh, freedom, the age of man. Um the rise of the orcs. It's, to me, it was like the whole, the, the, the whole world of humans and of elves and all of them are going to be wiped out. The world as they know it will be wiped out, right? Would you say that's a fair ass assessment of it? Yes. <coughs> the stakes don't get much higher than that. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. So you got to have something at stake in your story. A lot of times organizations will they'll, they'll deliver what they say as a story, or they may call it a case study. But I think what separates real storytelling from a case study are these elements here. Case studies rarely have vivid characters. There's rarely dialogue. There's rarely conflict. They may, they may talk about the problem, but they don't really talk about conflict. And they don't, they don't rarely talk about what was at stake for that organization if they didn't solve the problem. So if you're using case studies and customer stories, find ways to include these elements and they'll be far more compelling for your audience. Personal details. In other words, if, you are the, if you're the protagonist of the story, if you're telling your own story, be willing to share some personal details. If you're not the protagonist of the story, if someone else is the protagonist of the story, share personal details about them as well. 
So what were some personal details? Raise your hand if you could describe personal details that I shared in the, in the course of this story. Anyone? Anyone? I feel like, I feel like Ben Stein and Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Anyone? Anyone? Yes, back here, this gentleman in the, in the black. Meyer, if you don't mind. What's your name, sir? Eric. Eric. Thank you, Eric. Uh, you're not drinking? Say it again. You're not drinking? I'm not drinking. That's correct. That was a little personal detail that I slipped in there. Because partly what you're trying to do when you deliver any presentation, thank you, by the way, Eric. Partly what you're trying to do is you're trying to create an emotional connection with the audience. And you're trying to establish some trust and credibility. We trust people we know. If you help the audience know you, they're more likely to trust you. So when you share personal details like that, it helps the audience get to know you. And then vulnerability. Well, I remember when I first started doing this work 17 years ago, I, I was a total noob to the corporate environment. I felt like I, a lot of times I'd go in and I'd lead these workshops. And the workshops would go well. I mean, make no mistake, the, the clients seemed pretty happy. But I often felt like, I have no idea what I'm doing. I don't know this world. And the last thing in the world I felt like I wanted to do was show vulnerability. But think about it. If you've ever seen a, a leader, or if you've ever had a manager whose attitude is, yep, yep, we've delivered. Uh, Massive implementations for Fortune 500 companies all over the globe. I've done and seen pretty much everything there is to do, and I've always killed it. Would you want to follow somebody like that? Would you want to work for somebody like that? I doubt it. I wouldn't. So that a willingness to show vulnerability. In fact, executive coaches, there's a, there's a technique called disclosure that executives are taught to do, to reveal personal details about themselves, to make the audience feel like they have a connection, personal connection with that person. That's the vulnerability part. All right, raise your hand if you can describe the vulnerability where it was present in my story. Yes, right down here. And remind me of your name again, sir. Zach. Thank you, Zach. Tell where the vulnerability was present here. Uh, your 2 a.m. change of heart. Your 2 a.m. change of heart on two your excitement for the speech coming. Right, exactly. The 2 a.m. change of heart, getting psyched out by it. Okay, great. Was there another, either Zach or anybody else, was there another example? Yes, right here. Brad, right, Brad. Thank you, Brad. Uh, when you had to talk uh, on the third day when everyone was A little louder. When you had to talk on the third day when everyone was tired and not interested, too uh, one person going after you before they could fly home. Okay, great. So that was another, that was a detail that rev revealed the vulnerability. All right, uh, somebody back here that had their hand up. Was, this, was that a different detail? What's your name, sir? Uh, Russell. Russ, what was, what was the Russ, what was the detail what, you heard, Russ? When you went to, when you, when you went up to the uh, podium and you were visibly shaking. Yes. And you were holding on to the podium to so no one would notice. Okay, great. Thank you, Russ. And yep. then was, was there anybody, was there any other examples of vulnerability? You know what, I'm just gonna do this myself. Uh, you could feel your pulse in your forehead. My pulse in my forehead. All right, good, yeah. thank you. And your name again was Mir. Mir. Thank you, Mir. All right, so vulnerability needs to be present in the story. If you wanna create that connection, that emotional connection with your audience, and this is absolutely critical. You also have to know, how am I going to transition from the story to the point that the story makes? And in a little bit, I'm going to talk about how do you distill your message so that the point you want to make is absolutely clear. And be but before I do that, I need some help again. Can anybody here identify these Chinese characters. Yes. What is your name, sir? OK. 
say it for us again. Uh, what is your name again? Uh, just call me Yin. Yin? Yeah. Okay, great. Yin, what does that mean? That's a Chinese word, Yin Xiong, for hero. Hero. Uh -huh. Yes. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you okay. helping me out there. Now, our company, the Henderson Group, is based in San Francisco. We've been working with high-tech organizations for 24 years. And in the engineering community, there are, a lot, there are a fair number of people who can interpret these characters. So when I lead workshops and I show this character, these characters and I ask, what do they mean? The answer always comes back the same. It's always hero. Now one of the things I love about Chinese characters is you know, the English alphabet is just a series of abstract characters. They don't have any inherent meaning in and of themselves. But Chinese characters actually have a pictorial quality to them. So like art, they invite a personal interpretation. Now when I think about the idea of the hero, my eye is drawn to the figure on the, the right hand side. Sorry, the left hand side. Where I see a person with legs, arms, and a head. And somebody in one of my workshops said, oh, the squiggles at the top, that represents the feathers in the headdress of a warrior's helmet. So I imagine this warrior who is about to, to go into battle, about to face significant risk, and yet notice the stance of the hero. Feet are wide, firmly planted, arms open as though ready to embrace whatever his or her fate may be on that particular day. I think that's an appropriate symbol for the hero. Anytime you get up in front of a group of people and speak, there's some risk involved. It takes courage to do that. And one of you has an, an opportunity to demonstrate an exceptionally high, high level of courage by volunteering to come up and help me. I want to help you take your skills to the next level right here, right now. Who's that courageous hero who's going to lead us into our future? All right, please come on up. Let's give this gentleman a giant hand of, round of applause. So again, your name is? Pavan. Pavan. Okay, Pavan, we're going to get you mic'd up here. Right. Now, as Josh is getting you set up with a microphone, what I want you to do is I want you to think about a topic, because I'm going to ask you to speak to the, to the group in a minute. And what I, I want you to speak about your, why don't you come over here, Pavan. What I want you to do is I want you to speak about your current experience of speaking. In other words, when you get up in front of groups of people, what is that like? Now, before you start speaking, I, I want your permission. Can I stop you if I see something I think is worthy of coaching? Of course. Is yeah. that fair? Yeah. OK, great. So do you understand what I'm asking you to do? My heart is ra racing right now. OK. <laughs> 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 all right. So say that again. Congratulations, you are alive, sir. Because <laughs> if it wasn't going at all, that would be a bad thing. Yeah. Right. So the 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 thing I want you to Can tell. I get of course, help yourself. I don't think I've drunk from that one yet. Yeah. I've probably drank from all the other two already. All right. But yeah, what I want you to do is I want you to tell the group two things. One, what is it like when you have to speak in, in front of groups of people? What kind of things happen? How does it feel? Et cetera, et cetera. And then what I want you to do is to describe what you'd like to change first. What's the one thing that you'd want to change right away? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, then okay. please, you have the stage. So how, many, how much time do I have? Or? Well, I don't know, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> According to my timer, it's 26 minutes, so no. Uh, well. There'll be, there'll be a point at which I'll stop you, I promise. Uh, okay. Um, now, that's the point. So, <laughs> I'm stopping you now. Okay. Now, why do you think I stopped Pavan? Looking down. Say it again. Um, 
Yeah, actually, the, the looking down is equally valid. But that's, I, I wouldn't say that was a, a particularly big deal. But what you did there, Pavan, is you used what I call verbal filler. Um, uh, you know, like, basically, any phrase that people tend to repeat over and over and over until it loses all its meaning can become a verbal filler. Not just the ums and the uhs, right? Now, if, how many of you here, has anybody here ever taken a course on public speaking before? Raise your hand if you've ever had a course. Oh, wow, quite a few of you. Of those of you who raised your hand, did they talk about this phenomena? They, they, they might call it verbal filler or crutches or something, but they, they probably referred to, raise your hand if in that, that was part of the curriculum. Okay, raise your hand if they talked about the root cause of it. I'm not seeing a single hand go, one. Okay, my ear, excuse me. Would you please bring this to that gentleman? What was your name, sir? Ankel. Ankel? Ankel, A-N-K-I-D. Ankid. Yep. Am I getting that right? Yep. Okay, what did they say was the root cause? The root cause is the speed with which we speak and the way we think. There's a mismatch in that and we try to uh, speak it, speak fastly, and we, we try to cover it with filler. We're trying to speak too quickly? Is that basically yeah. what they're saying? Yeah. So our, our, our brain isn't fast enough to keep yeah. up with our mouth. That's interesting. I have a different theory. Now, who's right? I don't know. That's a theory. I have a theory. Thank you, Ankit. I appreciate that. My belief is this. The root cause of verbal filler is a lack of comfort with silence. If you're comfortable with silence, you're not going to use verbal filler. And silence is so important. It seems like such a simple thing. And it is simple. But when you're feeling anxiety, it's harder to hold that silence. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to, Pavan, I'm going to ask you to start speaking again. And this time, what I want you to do is I want you to actually focus, certainly on what you're going to say, yes, but almost even more, what I want you to focus on is the silence. And be willing to take as much time as you need. Now, Ankit, you said it was about the speed, right? Well, I think it's related. But I think what happens is if we don't feel, if we don't give ourselves permission to have silence, we feel like we have to keep talking. And that's what drives the, because if I don't have the right words, um, you know, I just got to keep the sound, you know, going, because if I don't make sound, what are they going to think? And I don't think, I, I actually don't think it's the speed. I think it's the lack of comfort with silence. So here's what, again, what were the instructions? What have I asked you to do? Um. <laughs> <laughs> I need help. So my goal here today, as you stated, is um, I would come on. Now, <laughs> here's the thing. This is really important for you, Pavan, and for everybody who wants to take this on. Give yourself a break. You're being way too hard on yourselves. I, earlier, how many of you remember when I said, if you have this idea that you're going to do a perfect presentation? Remember me? Anybody remember me saying that? OK, I am here to disabuse you of that notion today. It will never happen, ever. I've made at least five mistakes over the course of this talk this morning. Not that I'm counting. Probably more than that, actually. The point isn't perfection. The point is clarity. The point is connection. The point is getting the audience to have an emotional response, to feel connected with you. That's the point. And it actually, I think perfection is counter to that. You've got the wrong goal if your goal is to be perfect. Because it's not human to be perfect. And being human is what this is all about. So if it happens again, just 
remind yourself, what are you working on? What is your focus? What are you trying to do? What is it again? Talk about my past experience talking. And? Uh, and what I want to get out of it. And right what now. was the focus I gave you for the exercise, the specific thing? Help them out. What is it? Oh, just right now. Practice silence. Practice silence. Okay, so, pre so I'm going to talk, and when I'm not talking, I'm going to be silent. That's it. Can you, do. you ready to do it? Yeah. Okay, go for it. Bear with me. We're in the silent phase here. Now, there was an opportunity to practice silence right there. Okay, that, okay. All right, I thought, just trying to. Here's the other thing. Funny. Here's the other thing I want <laughs> everybody to get. <laughs> Silence creates tension. Okay. You feel it? <laughs> great storytellers, great presenters are masterful at creating tension. So when you use silence, it's actually helping you. You are creating more attention, which means you get more attention. So don't be a, take 10 seconds. I was leading a workshop recently. I've got a new trainer that I'm bringing up to speed. She's got a lot of talent and capability. I think she's going to be amazing. I was doing this one piece where it was interactive, like we were doing earlier, and I asked the audience questions. And she said, you know, there was one question you asked, Harry, and there was 22 seconds of silence. And I, I said, I love that you timed it. I don't, remember, I don't remember what it was, but it's that willingness to be silent. So if it's 10 seconds, fine, let it be 10 seconds. You're just drawing them in. Well, I do have a story I want to tell. There are two stories. It's been a while ago, but they're relevant. In college, I worked hard and not, not in the sense that you're thinking, yeah, I worked hard on my other things, but I worked hard on getting to be on this uh, cultural committee that, would, that was putting up this big show and I worked hard to, to get to be the president of that organization that did that. I got the position. But I don't think everybody in that team appreciated me getting that role. Nevertheless, I got it. I was in college. And I had ulterior motives. The girls. The, the food. <laughs> there, was a, there was a lot to it. I mean, what we were organizing, yeah, we were doing that, but there was a lot more to it at stake for me. And like he said, it was a four or five day uh, event. There was food, there was no sleep, games, beer, lots of that. <laughs> I was writing checks for that. And I had no discipline. I had participated in that debauchery. And the day came when there was the keynote, and I wasn't the only speaker. There were other folks. And my role, my, I had my time that I would, that, that, where I had to say something. I would practiced. But at that point, I hadn't slept for two days. And there was a podium. I got there. My legs weren't actually shaking, per se, but I was sleepy. I forgot every joke that I was supposed to make. My notes didn't even make sense at that point. I was like, what did I write here? <laughs> what am I supposed to say? And then my legs started shaking. My hands started shaking. That podium started shaking. I was falling apart, and I didn't 
recover. The girls I wanted to impress were looking at me. The people were looking at me as if, who made him the president? <laughs> and I remember that feeling so well. It's been so years, so many years. It's not come off of me. Cut. Let's go to the second story. <laughs> Is it all right if I stop you, Pavan? Yeah. Now, first of all, what do you think? What was that like? What was that like? I felt good. I was in the moment. I was, you know, I was visualizing this whole thing in my head. And I, I actually got transported back to that day when I was standing there. OK, cool. Now, have you and I ever met before today? I don't think so. Have we ever talked before today? No. Have we ever slapped salmon before today? <laughs> Maybe so, over there. Maybe yeah. over there. <laughs> no. So it's not like you and I worked this out, right? No. No. You didn't know this was going to happen. I didn't. Right. I had no idea who was going to come up here. No, not, nothing, no setup. Just another dude. So how, just another dude. <laughs> Somebody tweet that. Just another dude. <laughs> That's the best line so far of the conference, maybe. I don't know. But how would you describe Pavan now? Raise your hand if you have an adjective you would use to describe the Pavan that you just saw. Yes, Sandy. Smooth. Smooth. Genuine. Genuine. Confident. Confident. Confident? My hero, nice. <laughs> Measured. Okay, great. Calm, composed. Calm, composed. More than just another dude. More than just another dude. All right, great. Back here. Engaging. Thank you. Polished. Charismatic. Charismatic. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> now, what I changed? What changed for you? I think taking that time to, to calm down and yeah. to, uh, to phrase those sentences. In fact, I, I think if you looked at the video later, you'd see that my hand was actually you, shaking. I did see your hand shaking. And, and none of those feelings were inside me. I was just telling that story, and I tried to not focus on anything else. Yeah. And that's it. You're my hero, man, my friend. Thank you very much. That was great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So what we just did was just, we, we, I gave Pavan one technique, which was silence. But I think what you've got is the power of it. The, the power of silence has a cascading effect. Pavan had time to talk, to think. He had time to formulate his thoughts. Your vocabulary will get better. Your points will have more impact. You will have more confidence, more calm, more charisma if you just practice silence. That's all you could, if you just take that from today, that's amazing, as far as I'm concerned. Thanks again, Pavan, that was great. I have one more piece, because you've got to have a well-structured message to be effective. Uh, Pavan was telling a story, which I, I love that story, I think that's great. But you've got to know how you're going to structure your message. So let's talk about how to structure your message to get maximum impact. Raise your hand if you find yourself sometimes channel surfing when you watch TV. Okay, great, quite a few. I'm a DVR guy, so I'm at home, I never channel surf. But when I'm at hotels, like I've been here the last week, I do channel surf. And here's what happens for me. I click, the new channel appears on the screen, I make a decision about whether I'm gonna stay or I'm gonna click and go on to the next channel. That span of time for me is maybe a second, two seconds at most. Is there anyone here who stays longer than five seconds? One hand just went up. Thank you, sir. The Guardian the, in the UK just recently, po they, they, didn't, they, they published an article, I think it was last year, they estimated the average adult attention span is now six seconds long. So you have six seconds in your opening. Okay, let's be generous. Let's say it's 10 to 15. You've got 10 to 15 seconds to grab that audience's attention. And I promise you, your name is not a hook, unless you're Miguel de Acaza. Your name is not a hook. So hello, my name is. Thank you for coming today. 
none of that is a hook. Now, I'm not saying don't say that. I'm just saying hook me first and then say that. So what do we know works for a hook? Personal stories. You saw how compelling it was for Pavan to share his personal story. That's a powerful hook. It's not the only hook. You can ask questions. I've been asking you questions throughout the morning. In fact, I'm doing something called interactivity. I'm polling you. I'm requiring that you respond. You think about the question. Those are great, great ways to get the audience engaged. A provocative statement. As I went into my story this morning, I said, your predecessor was fired for three reasons. That's a provocative statement. If you can get your audience to participate in an activity, we've been doing activity throughout the, the morning here. I'm asking you questions, you're responding, that interactivity, very powerful. Props. Did I use a prop at some point during my talk today? Yes. Call, just call it out. Yes, well, that's true. A piece of paper. A piece of paper was used as a prop in, in my talk. It was a prominent part of the talk. It was an important part of the talk. So props are great ways to grab attention. Now, here's what I... What did I say earlier about hooks? Who remembers? I gave you two pieces of advice about hooks. Who can say, raise their hand and say, I remember it, what they were? OK, yes, Sean, just call it out. Start with three hooks. Start with three hooks. So at the beginning of my talk, the one thing I haven't put on here is evocative image. I had the picture of the scream. I asked you if you knew the name of the painter. And then I started my story with, your predecessor was fired for three reasons. So in the course of a minute, I gave you three hooks right on top of each other. That's what I want you to be doing in your opening. And then what was the other piece, Sean? Do you remember that? Use, Use hooks throughout the whole talk. So I've been doing it constantly since I got up here. All right, now what do we got to do as we think about the body of the presentation? Number one, I want you to be able to distill your entire talk down to one sentence. Rob, if I put you on the spot, could you give me your main takeaway sentence? No, I'm sorry, shouldn't do that. Rob's one of the guys I've worked with. And the first thing that I do when I sit down with a client to work on a talk is I say, what's your main takeaway sentence? It's a summary of the entire talk in one sentence that describes either the call to action or what they get from the talk. I'll, I'll give you an example. Sir Ken Robinson, anybody even recognize that name? How do, how, where is he from? And why would you know him? He, he has the number one most viewed TED Talk, 29 million views and counting. He says in the course, I remember watching the video, and it, it was like when he said it, this sentence was practically a neon. He said, creativity is now as important in education as literacy, and we should treat it with the same status. That was the essence of his talk in one sentence. That's what I mean by main takeaway sentence. You should know what that sentence is for your talk. You'll have great clarity. You'll know what fits in the talk because it supports or illustrates the sentence. And if it doesn't, it doesn't belong in your talk. Cut it. Ideally, you can then go to the next step and create what I call a central theme. It's either based on a story or a metaphor. And you use imagery to convey it. So what's the visual theme that you see on the screen here? What's on the screen at the top? Call it out. An arrow. An arrow. What was on this, the screen before this? An archer. So the theme of archery is a theme that runs through this workshop that we do called Art of Presentation. And it's re I tell a story about archery that's part of the, the, the course. So that visual theme of archery runs throughout the course. Rule of three. Have three points to support your main takeaway sentence. Deliver examples in groups of three. Phrases in groups of three. Maybe the best speech in American history. Government of the people, by the people, for the people. That rhythm of three is very satisfying. Know how you're going to transition from one point to the next. Transitions are critical moments in presentations. If they're overlooked, the audience gets lost, or worse, the presenter gets lost. So practice your transitions. They're probably 
other than the opening and the conclusion, the most important parts of your whole talk. What does this stand for? Call it out. What's in it for me? Every audience member you will ever face is asking themselves this question. Answer it explicitly. If you internalize and practice these techniques, I promise you, you will be a better, more compelling, more effective speaker. That's what's in it for you. Now, as we think about the conclusion, what do we have to happen here? What has to occur? We have to fulfill that urge for completion. You've had this experience. You go to a movie. Through the first three quarters of the movie, you're loving it. This is a great movie. This is awesome. The ending kind of goes, bleh, falls flat. You walk out the door. You turn to your friend, and you say what? That movie sucked. Three quarters of it was good. But you don't even remember that part. All you remember is that bad conclusion. Therefore, the whole movie sucked. So that's why you've got to deliver a good conclusion. And just like you crafted a main takeaway sentence, just like you crafted an opening sentence, you've got to craft your final sentence so you know exactly how you're going to conclude. And then when you deliver it, deliver it with a tone that says, I'm done? That's not it. Your tone has to say, I am done. You're going to find you're having, you're having to real-time edit. You have more material than you plan or th than you have time for. So ahead of time, give some thought to what piece could I cut if I have to. And be ready to do it if you have to based on the time that you've given. And then what techniques do we know work for conclusions? Create a future vision. Martin Luther King said, I have a dream. That was a future vision. When John F. Kennedy said, we should put a man on the moon and bring him home safely, that was a future vision. That future vision was so powerful that in less than 10 years, which was his goal, we put a man on the moon and brought him home safely, even though nobody knew how that was going to happen when he made that statement. That's the power of a future vision. It creates emotional buy-in when the audience gets excited about that vision. Picasso, Pablo Picasso, said, good artists copy, great artists steal. Take Picasso's advice. Steal from other people. Shakespeare maybe wrote one a, original story. Every single play he wrote was borrowed from somebody else. Now, he did it 10 times better, but nonetheless, he stole somebody else's source material. If you want your audience to take action, tell them explicitly what they, you want them to do. I want everybody in this room to be able to have a strong opening, three opening hooks, a clear main takeaway sentence, clear segues, and a strong conclusion. That's my call to action for all of you. And then when you're not sure how to close, because sometimes I, I find the close is the toughest part. You just revisit your opening. So if you practice these techniques, two things are going to happen. One, you're going to keep your audience on your channel the whole time, so they're not channel surfing. And number two, the next time you have to deliver a truly high stakes presentation, my hope is that you're not going to feel like you want to scream. My name is Terry Galt. My Twitter handle is at Terry Galt. Please feel free to email me, terry at hendersongroup.com. If you go to our blog, which is speakfearlessly.com, the, the, you'll see a link off to the right that says workshop resource super storytelling. You can download PDFs on the storytelling piece that I shared with you today. You can download PDFs on how to structure your presentation. There's lots of great resources there. Have a great conference. I've really enjoyed your talk.